I, uh, well, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about tonight is um, I thought I'd just introduce the concept of resilience and how it's sort of come across in terms of sort of modern psychology. Some hints and tips, because I'm sure that's why a lot of you are here, is, you know, I want to learn how to be more resilient. And then I actually, in my personal experience of talks, etc., I find that the, the most useful part for me is often the Q&A. So what I'll do is I won't speak for so long, I'll open it up with questions, because often I find that's where you get the real juice of what you're looking for. So, first of all, I just want to ask, you know, what, what does resilience mean to you? Anyone? Uh, yeah. Being able to overcome adversity that life might throw at you. Okay, so overcoming adversity. Yeah, yeah that's, that's sort of common. Being able to bounce back. Yeah, being able to bounce yeah, back. Tenacity. Yeah. Luke? Uh, reconciling adversity, so bouncing back, but also kind of pocketing it away and integrating it. So understanding yeah. the nature of it. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. Not being with everything uh, not absolute. Like, yeah. Not being with. Uh, not being like absolute. absolute not being rigid with everything. Not being what with everything? Rigid. So? Rigid. Rigid. So yes. being flexible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, being flexible. Anyone else got? Yeah? Uh, just understanding failure and moving on. You know. Understanding failure and moving on. I mean, we're all in the same ballpark, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, not being overwhelmed by things. So. Yeah, absolutely. Being in control. Being in control. Yeah. yeah, that's a really important part. Anyone else got a. Yeah, I'd say not being damaged by it. Not being damaged by it. Yeah, not okay. being damaged by that. Okay, I mean, there is, there is a case, there's this concept we'll come to later on called hormesis, which is that actually you can get damaged and still come back from it. And I know but exactly what you're saying. Not, yeah. not having lasting damage. Exactly, yeah. Growing stronger. Growing stronger. Yeah, that's, that's the key concept of what we call post-traumatic growth, um, which is becoming more and more popular and is, is a, seen as a natural phenomenon. Okay, so... Kind of the, main, the leading expert on uh, resilience is someone called Karen Rivich, who's at the University of Pennsylvania. She's written um, a lot since, since the 90s, actually, on, on resilience. And she defines resilience as the ability to draw upon internal and external resources in a time of need. And that's something that, you know, if you want to become more resilient, you need to reflect on that. You have to ask yourself, do I have a lot of those kind of resources? Do I have a lot of internal resources and do I have a lot of external resources? Because both of those come together. You know, asking for help in any form, going to the doctor, etc., might be you know, an external resource. An internal resource might be being able to sort of savor some kind of old memory that you had that got you through something and being able to connect with that. Or being confident and having the esteem to believe that you can get through a situation, etc. So resilience covers kind of both of those, and um, I'm sure that you know, in my own case, I'm really having to work on my resilience at the moment. I was talking to Luke earlier that I uh, I keep getting ill at the moment. It's becoming really frustrating. So I, I, I finally bucking the trend of most males my age. I actually went to the doctor. I went to the doctor today, and um, I have to go get a blood test, and that's an example of me actually having to go and you know use some kind of external resource because I need to. But to go back to so psychological resilience, we need to look at uh, some <coughs> key areas. The, one, the first one I want to uh, just talk a little bit about is, is cognitive resilience. Do you have the cognitive tools to be able to assess a situation that maybe is stressing to you? Do you have um, the ability to sort of cut through what's going on? You know, for example, do you catastrophize, or are you able to step back, assess the situation, and go from there? And there's, Karen Rybich identifies um, what she calls thinking traps. And we've spoken about this before, if you come to some of the other groups, but the main um, thinking traps are that uh, anything that, you, that happens to you now is pervasive in everything else in your life. And that's, a, that's a, a pessimistic viewpoint. Do you believe that if something goes wrong now, it means that every part of your life is going wrong? We call that pervasiveness. 
do you fall into that trap? Do you fall into the, the one of the main ones? Do you fall into the trap of mind reading? Now, mind reading is is like, do you, in a, even in a conversation with someone, do you expect the other person to totally understand <coughs> everything that you're saying, even if you haven't told them? Or the other way around, the, the opposite as well. So we got you know believing that you can read everyone else's minds and they can read your mind without actually ever making it explicit. And I think. Most anyone who's ever been in a romantic relationship can identify with that. I think every, everyone I know has been guilty of a form of mind reading, either expecting um, your partner to know exactly why you are acting or feeling the way you are without explaining it, and vice versa. So we want to look at, you know, am I falling into the thinking trap of, of mind reading? Can I bust myself doing it? Um, it's, there's, the other one she calls it, it's all about me. As in everything is my fault, we call that uh, negative narcissism. You know, am I falling into that trap? That everything, am I, I'm all powerful and therefore I can affect everything. The other thinking trap is it's, it's all about you. It's all your fault, everything. Have you fallen into that? Have you lost that sense of agency? And then catastrophizing. Do you find that you catastrophize, that if one little small thing goes wrong, you believe that everything goes wrong? And everyone at times will fall into those thinking traps, but when you work on, your, work on those, your resilience increases because you're able to assess the situation and see, you know, am I falling into that trap? Am I falling into that trap? Do I regularly fall into that trap? And if I do, start changing it. The first stage of any change is awareness. So you need to identify it first to be able to act on it. So we have many cognitive tools to increase your resilience and I uh, encourage you to um, look up things like learned optimism etc. Martin Seligman's written a brilliant book on learned optimism which is full of tools of increasing your cognitive skills. And I can um, Anyone can ask me at the end, I've got loads of references I'd be very happy to give you. But we do need to work on, you know, our thinking skills. It's really, really important. You know, when, when you are in an adverse situation, can you see it for what it is? Or do you jump to automatic conclusions that aren't necessarily true? There's someone called, um, some of you may have come across a Byron Katie, her name's the wrong way around. You would think that she'd be called Katie Byron, but she's called Byron Katie. She's got some good stuff online, but she's got these four questions that she asks in any, you know, ask yourself in any situation. It's the first two that are really important. The first question is, is it true? And then the second question is, can you absolutely know it's true? Because I've seen, I, you know, myself, but I've seen other people start catastrophizing, getting themselves, you know. You know when someone's panicking, they're getting overwhelmed, you want to shake them, etc. And you, you can ask them, is it true? Of course it's true. Is it absolutely true? Well, I don't know. You know, that automatic jump. So, you know, a resilient person, or if you want to really increase your resilience, you have to start ask, asking yourself those questions first. So that's an example of one, one area you can go to cognitively. There are other um, skills like the whole host of CBT skills, etc. But you know, really working on that, just is it true and do I have evidence? Because one way of looking at um, resilience is it's the ability to quickly charge your battery in a situation. Do I have certain tools where I can give myself a little boost to take me over the line when I'm in that situation that is causing me stress, etc. And one way of looking at it is we most of you will probably relate to being in, you're, you're doing something, it's going well, it's kind of easy, you're not thinking about it, you're, you're kind of in the zone, and then you sort of notice that you're coming out of that zone and things are starting to become a bit difficult. You may have been writing a paper and for a couple of hours you're writing and then you, you're noticing that you're getting a bit tired, you've got a deadline, etc. When you're coming out of the ease and into the stress, we call that you're coming into the hyper-reactive 
zone. And that's the area where you can make a difference. If you keep pushing through that, then you get into sort of severe stress and damage, etc. But when you kind of notice yourself coming out of the ease and into the stress, that's where we want to start utilizing certain skills. And something that really comes into play there is, anyone here, people aware of heart rate variance? What that even means? Got any medics or in here? Okay, so heart rate variance is the difference, the difference between my heartbeats. And let's say Razzy and I have um, an average of 60 BPM each of us. And you might think, okay, that's a, that's a good, good heart rate. It's, it's, we're, they're both going well. But actually, it turns out that if you measure the, the difference between my heartbeats, mine is just going from 55 to 65, even though it averages out at 60. But Razzie's is going from 40 to 80. He is much more resilient. He is in a much healthier place than I am. Because actually his nervous system is able to tolerate much, much more. So we develop a whole load of techniques, etc., to increase your heart rate variance. That ability to... Because when, when your heart is beating, say, 80 compared to 40, you're in the parasympathetic, the fight and flight part of your nervous system. And when you're in the lower BPM, you're in your parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest part of your nervous system. And that variance between the two actually indicates a very robust nervous system. So to become resilient, we actually, one of some of the skills we really do is, is to really focus on increasing your heart rate variance. And there are certain skills you can do, which we, you know, we could all do now, right now, Okay, I encourage you, everyone in the room, if you're able to, don't do it if you, this freaks you out or whatever, but just to close your eyes and just to breathe in for five seconds and breathe out for five seconds and do that, say, ten times and just really notice how hard or easy that is for you. Maybe I should have said five times. It's quite a long time to think that. <laughs> but I'm sure some of you noticed that that was probably quite easy to do. Yeah. And some of you might have found that quite difficult. And maybe three seconds or four <clears throat> seconds. But the five seconds in and five seconds out is actually kind of the ideal of breathing. If you're struggling to get to sleep, I really suggest that you close your eyes and just focus on that five in and five out. Five in and five out. That's the an ideal breast cycle for increasing your heart rate variance. So one, one technique to do is just literally just keep practicing doing that kind of breathing. And that will start really affecting your autonomous nervous system, which means then you'll be able to take more. And then you can expand on that. You can expand on doing that um, with uh, adding extra things. So the next stage is to, uh, to do that kind of breathing, but imagine that you're breathing through your heart center and that actually calms your nervous system down. And then when you start getting really good at that, you start integrating a positive memory and the feelings associated with a positive memory. You start being able to bring that in and you will find that you, we, you get into a state of what we call coherence. And a coherent state is where you the variance between your heartbeats is really smooth 
you get a nice, really smooth cycle. And there's lots of software now that you can use with your phone, etc., that measures your heart rate variance. But these techniques are all about strengthening your nervous system, which is a, a really good way of building your resilience. Particularly when you're in that, when you when you get into that hyperreactive stage, when you're coming out of the ease and you're getting into the stress zone, these techniques really work. And a lot of these days, there's a lot of emphasis on mindfulness and mindful apps, etc. And they're great, but just be wary of when they ask you to extend your breath out compared to the in breath, because when you're breathing out, you're triggering your parasympathetic nervous system which is what calms you down. And when you're breathing in, you're triggering your sympathetic nervous system. You're doing that all the time when you breathe. When you extend the, the breathing out and are boosting the parasympathetic, which is to calm you down, you're not actually strengthening your nervous system. So if we're looking, it's great if you want to relax, etc. But if you want to really build up your nervous system, you want to be evening them out. So that's why we emphasize on doing five seconds in, five seconds out, etc. If you just witness something horrendous, having a panic attack, etc., <coughs> then the breathing out for longer is, is a useful tool. But in general, in terms of sort of uh, flexibility, etc., you want to keep the, the breath even. And this is uh, something, you know, I, I re always really, uh, with clients, etc., encourage yoga, but yoga often uh, focuses a lot on the parasympathetic, the calming down side, which is great, but not it's not so great for building your resilience. It's just great for de-stressing. So we got we got cognitive exercises to do. Then we've got working on your heart rate variance, and particularly that stage when you notice that you're getting into stress. Start utilizing some of those tools to give you that little boost over the line to to take you there and that's often what differentiates the resilient person from the person who collapses is the ability to analyze their cognitive processes are you falling into any of those thinking traps and actually start using some of those the tools you know trying to get yourself into what we call a coherent state getting your heart rate variance um, even and wide then there's um, really simple things. I, I was talking with someone earlier, and I really recommend, if you're interested in this, looking up the podcasts. He's got so many, but you can search through them. But there's a guy, some of you might have heard of him, called Ben Greenfield. And he's probably the lead, sort of the most listened to podcast and one of the leading experts in the States on nutrition, health, etc. And he... He... Um, he uh, talks a lot about the importance of diet in terms of resilience. And that the most important thing that he talks about is keeping your, what you, they call your glycemic variability. So I think most of you can relate that you're a bit tired at work, stressed out, you're, you're hitting that two, three in the afternoon stage where all you want to do is yawn and you think you could go to sleep forever. And then when it comes to five or six, you're wide awake again. But that, you know, that cycle, everyone kind of relates. Like when I'm at work, like the three o'clock client, like if you, little tip, if you're booking therapy, don't try and avoid the three o'clock slot because your therapist is going to be knackered. Um, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's true. Like you, you're sitting there and you're like, or you, you, you think, oh, did I just hear what they said? Like, so I need, I need tools to get me through that, etc. But one of the tools is to try and keep my blood sugar level even throughout the day. That will increase my resilience. So many of us can relate to you, you, you feel really tired, you go get something that's full of sugar, and uh, you have a sugar crash. It works for a bit, or you get, have a cup of coffee and then you crash. And one of the really simple things to do is to get yourself some dried fruit and nuts. Because what you're doing is you're getting a slow release sugar hit as opposed to an instant sugar hit <coughs> and that will make a huge difference to your performance for those few hours and there's all sorts of other techniques that you can use around diets to keep your glycemic variability now 
it's quite amusing. Van Greenfield talks about because he's he's like he does all those Spartan runs and triathlons and all sorts of things. But he'll talk about before he go before he goes for to eat, he'll go to the bathroom and he'll pretend that he's going to the loop. What actually he's doing is going out to do a quick twenty burpees or press ups, etc. If you get your heart rate up just before you eat, you're going to digest in a much healthier way. So it's another little technique here. Before you, before you eat, like run around the block or something to get your heart rate up. And you will, again, that really helps your glycemic variability. And then the other thing is, is to um, go for a walk after you eat. If you go out for dinner, go for, you know, you go, you're going on a date, etc. Suggest a walk afterwards. Because that's actually really good for you and really helps you digest, etc. And again, that will all help your resilience. It'll help your energy levels throughout the day. It'll mean that you're not spiking and crashing, spiking and crashing. These are techniques just to keep you, <coughs> to keep that uh, variability down. And so, I, you know, I, I, I started doing that anyway, actually, going for a walk. Um, and there's plenty of things you can use to help you with that. Um, the reminders on your phone, etc. But like, so one of the things you know is, is if you can do a tiny bit of. Uh, there's anyone know about this technique called Tabata? I might be pronouncing it wrong. But yeah, this it's about doing very, very, very short, high intensity. Uh, yeah, but what they found is that all you need is 30 seconds to make the difference between. So if you can just really like get your heart going for 30 seconds. That will make a huge difference. T A B A T A is the <coughs> how it's spelled. I think it's called well, that's high intensity, but that that's like a fifteen or twenty minute session. But this, but this this getting your heart rate. So people who are training for resilience now, what they're finding is it's it's better now to do ten minutes exercise six times a day. <coughs> Than it is to do a you know a full one hour gym session. It's much. It's going to increase your nervous system and increase your resilience massively if you do it that way. It's to keep constantly giving yourself these little um, boosts throughout the day rather than doing one big session and then sitting down all the time. So I don't know any of you got a Fitbit. Or a lot of people do. But, you know they remind you to get up and move every hour if you want it to. Um, <laughs> It's actually really useful to do that, just to get up, have a um, you know, a little stroll around and then go back to your desk, etc. I can actually relate to that. I hope you don't mind me speaking up. Yeah, because um, I work rotation. I do three weeks on, three weeks off. Yeah. And when I'm at work, I go for a run before yeah. starting off the day. And then through the morning we go for a walk and then I do a half hour walk with my boss at lunchtime. Then we go for a walk in the afternoon, then we walk after dinner. I generally hit the gym at lunchtime as well. So the exercise is all broken up throughout the day. When I'm home, I tend to just hit the gym for an hour and a half, and then I have a lazy day. Yeah. But when I'm home, I feel more tired. Exactly. This is, I mean, this is, yeah. this is what they're, they're finding more and more. That it's exactly the, the first process you're talking about. It's much going to give you that energy yeah. all throughout the day. That's it. I always feel really yeah. energized doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Even though it's actually, according to the Fitbit, more exercise. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's such. There's too much of a variable question. That I yeah. don't know what you're doing in those eight just nine hours. Moving, waitering. <laughs> but are you eating? Are you not eating? No, no, are just, you? Just moving and yeah, maybe eating once. Um, does, does it impact on resilience in any way? Well, it would. It, I'm, there's, again, there's too many different it's, things. It's a very vague question. It's too, yeah, for me to be able to answer. But it could be like this lady was saying here, really healthy, or it could be really unhealthy, depending on what you're doing. Okay. How are you sustaining those eight nine hours? Mm -hmm. You know, are you having a break? Are you just physically doing things? You in your head? Are you eating? What What are you eating? How much sleep did you get the night before? Uh -huh. You know, because if if um. If uh, there was one thing more than anything else that's going to make a difference to your resilience, it's sleep. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, 
there's no excuse for not really knowing what's going on with your sleep. There's, there's enough free apps, etc., on your phone, Fitbits, etc., that will monitor whether you're in light sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep, really analyze how your sleep is. Um, now, you know, you can get really good head, um, earplugs to help you sleep, things across there. It's the most crucial factor above anything else. You know what it's like when you don't get enough sleep. It's really hard to listen to people, it's really hard to think. You have a sleep and then that project is suddenly so much easier. It's the number one factor. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. But that's, if I was going to say anything to become more resilient, is, is to make sure that your sleep is good. I'm no sleep expert. What I do know about sleep is um, the best thing to do is, is, is to try and wake up um, at the end of a sleep cycle. An average sleep cycle is 90 minutes. So if you're going to have a power nap, either do up to 20 minutes, because then you don't get into deep sleep, or um, set the alarm for 90 minutes, because then you're coming out of the sleep cycle. Now in my own experience, and I'm known I'm not alone with this, is often if you fall asleep for 40 minutes, an hour, when you wake up it's horrendous in the day. You're really groggy because you're right in the middle of that sleep cycle. But try it. If you do the 90 minutes or up to 20 minutes, it's fine. It's really interesting. And there are certain other techniques you can do. There's a thing called um, yoga nidra, which means yogic sleep, which gets you into the alpha wave brain state where you're just before sleep, and that will really rejuvenate you. You never quite fall asleep. There's a yoga nidra. There's loads of free ones on YouTube, etc. But that gets you into the, the alpha brainwave state. Um, you're, you're awake, but you're kind of not. And it, that's very refreshing when you come out of it. You don't um, come out groggy, and it gives you a boost. So diet is really important. Um, going for a walk after you eat is really important. Keeping your glycemic variability constant is really important for your resilience. Now there's this concept of hormesis that I mentioned right at the beginning. Do people, anyone know what hormesis is? Gonna, you're going to you're going to hear a lot about it soon. It's becoming a bit of a buzzword. Hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S, -S. and it's basically what doesn't what doesn't kill you can make you stronger. It's a, it's a little bit like you know how uh, Rasputin was had allegedly taken tiny little bits of various poisons etc. to boost his immune system so that when he was actually poisoned, um, it didn't work. Now hormesis is is um, the sort of biggest examples of hermesis at work to boost your resilience that you know I'd recommend to people and you're seeing a lot is um, fasting. Intermittent fasting is becoming incredibly popular at the moment. It's actually quite easy to do because <coughs> the research is showing that to really get the benefits of uh, intermittent fasting you need to fast for 16, 17 hours but that includes sleep. So if you eat say at 7, 7.30 in the evening miss out breakfast, the <coughs> really important thing about intermittent fasting and fasting is you can't have any calories. So you can have like a peppermint tea or something, or water, but if you got coffee with milk in etc, that doesn't count. You've got to have zero calories. So for that 16, 17 hours, so you skip out breakfast and then you eat at lunch and you, you learn to train yourself to be able to do that and you do that maybe once a week. <coughs> Not often, but just... And every so often, if you can, say once a month, do a 24-hour fast. And that is a really um, quick, easy-ish way of boosting your resilience. Boost, and that's an, um, an example of hormesis. So starving yourself to actually make yourself stronger. How does that work? Is there, what's the logic behind it? There's so much uh, stuff you can you can um, read on that. I'm not I'm I don't, I'm careful I'm I'm wary to make I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but I'm going on um, what a lot of like what a really good friend of mine is a psychiatrist and he explained it to me perfectly the other day and I and I don't I I don't <coughs> wouldn't give it justice in the explanation. But, uh, well, I did it over the summer for two months and it was uh, really good. Yeah. I lost like eight kilos. But did you find your energy levels went up? They were more consistent. Right, yeah. 
But that it's yeah it's it's that's one of the the things that you find is that exactly that it's, it's a it's a clean up process and and the, some of the theory goes back that particularly in the winter months long time ago we would be more starving and you go into I think this is called ketosis and it's it's all based around that and it's becoming uh, it's very well researched now and I would in encourage people to look into it. Beforehand, but that's that's one technique that can really help your uh, body's resilience. It sounds like it's at odds with the recommendation of keeping a steady glycemic blood sugar level. <coughs> that's probably true. Sounds like two completely conflicting pieces of advice. Not. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, <coughs> um, it's a good point. I, I, I will, I'm going to look into that. But it, um, the. The, the main source of this that I got is from Ben Creedland, and he recommends both. He probably had the answer. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um, and then the other um, one that everyone can do is um, for building your resilience, and this is actually really works really, really well. So when you have a shower, have the last few minutes on cold. And try it. And see, it's, it's really hard to begin with, and it gets easier and easier. But you're, you're shocking your body when you do that. But again, this, this concept of hormesis is about shocking your body without ruining it, without taking it too far. And again, that's building yourself up. And that's a real simple one. And then some people, you know, this, my um, girlfriend, she's uh, Norwegian. And they love, like, doing these things, of going in the snow and into the ice lake, etc. And they've been doing it for years, and uh, they're pretty healthy people up there, much healthier than the British. And um, they, you know, this concept of, as I said, this concept of hormesis is going to become much more of a buzzword this year. You're going to hear what about that, it much what more. Does that mean, <coughs> I don't know the exact depth. Well, it means what I'm talking about here: of, of a little bit of shock, etc., can have a beneficial outcome. You know, it's that Nietzschean phrase: "What, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger." That makes me think of a bed of nails. That's similar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a circus trick to me. But like, no, 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 it's on Amazon. It's only about 16 pounds. I used to see right. them in a planet with for about, well, a lot more. But on Amazon, it's right. about 16 pounds. And it's quite big. It's just okay. really big. Okay. But, um, yeah, this, I mean, it's an really interesting thing about this concept of hormesis is, um, when Christopher Hitchens died, his uh, best friend, I'm having a complete mind blank right now, Martin, Martin Amis, spoke about um, this concept of hormesis, but, and he illustrates the point really well, because if you go too far, it's devastating. He said, actually, what didn't kill me just made me really, really weak and devastated. And that's a really important distinction. We have to, we have to know what our limits are around that. So. You know, I, was, I watched the documentary, this documentary yesterday, and it involved these people who got um, involved in drug smuggling in Indonesia in the 70s. And one of the guys, the leading members of it, was really into fasting. He fasted for 40 days and he died. You know, it, so you, you know, fast, fast one day a week, great, but to, you know, know what your limits are. Um, I mean, it sounds be, quite obvious. Would that be the addiction to the adrenaline rush overtaking? Yeah, I'd, well, I'd say there's an element of anorexia yeah. in there. Oh, okay. You know, like, what did Kate Moss say? Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. She's talking about the, the exact effect you're talking about there. Yeah. The, 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 the drug effect you get yeah. from starving yourself. Yeah. The rush. Yeah. And then, and then a really important thing to come back to in terms of resilience is, what are my motivations? And in psychology, we talk often about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. <coughs> so intrinsic motivation are things coming from within myself. So like, what are my values? Are my values at stake here? Um, 
how you know, like when we go back to the cognitive side of things, am I assessing this properly? Has my esteem around this, etc.? So we need to really work on our intrinsic motivation, but never underestimate what we call it extrinsic motivation. Um, a really simple thing is to, is to have a goal, you know, an external goal to boost your resilience, to keep you going, to give you that extra energy, like running the marathon or um, going on a on a a trip that involves a lot of exercise that you've got to train for before, like a climbing holiday or something. You know, those things really, really help boost your resilience. They give you that extra, often give you that, you know, that's why deadlines are, you know, motiv can be so motivating. You've got to value what's at stake there. You've got to value the deadline. But when it's there, that makes a huge difference to your resilience. And so, I've just given you an outline today of, of certain areas that you can look at, because I know that some of you are probably like, your cognitive skills are really good, but you didn't know anything about hormesis, and some of you the other way around, and might maybe different elements, but <coughs> what I'm hoping to get across to you, which you know, is nice for me, because I practice these things, is actually, it, it doesn't take much to keep boosting that. You know, there are just certain small things you can do every day that really add up to boost, you know, to boost that battery. Because what we're doing is we're not just giving you a little. Your phone's down on eight percent, and you want it, you need to put it up to fifteen percent to get over the line. We're also increasing the capacity of your battery as well. All these techniques are doing both those things. They're giving you that short-term charge, but they're also increasing the capacity that you have. And so you have to keep working on all these things all the time. And then you'll find that it just things get easier and easier and easier. In the same way that when you start, like recently I started running again. And, oh God, the first few runs are horrendous. And I still find the first 10 minutes of running dust my head in. I really don't like it. But um, it gets easier and easier and easier. And then I have to keep pushing either the time that I'm doing it in or the length of the run. You always have to keep moving that boundary as well, otherwise you stagnate. But in terms of you know drawing upon internal and external resources, if that's what we see, Rajin, I think Rivich is right about that. We uh, owe it to ourselves to really analyze and look at where am I doing well, where am I not doing so well, where can I take more responsibility, and it's within your reach to do all those things. You know slowly change your diet, do 30 seconds of cold water in the shower, then increase it to 40 seconds, etc. And another thing is, if we go back to sleep, does anyone know what the perfect sleeping temperature is? I only learned this the other day, what your room should be. 18 degrees. 18 degrees, yeah. So like, just set, set it, set, you know, these things are all going to make a difference. Does that apply to every culture? Because <laughs> if you grew up in a super hot country or a super cold country, if you grow up in a super hot country, you usually have a fan and air conditioning to keep it cool. So it probably is the same for everyone. You know, maybe it's give or take half a degree. But this is, you know, you can get, um, you can get, I do know that men and women have slightly different body temperatures on average. And there was a big um, hoo-ha about men keeping their air conditioning in offices at the men's level and not what was conducive for women. And I know that, you know, like, and just from personal experience, that my girlfriends would often find something colder than I did. Um, you can at now get things for the bed that will keep one half of the bed at a different temperature to the other half of the bed. <laughs> it's actually true, and uh, apparently this is making a big difference to people's relationships, you know, <laughs> happiness in the relationship. So it's amazing what you find you know, could make the difference and could work. So what I thought is I'd leave it at that, and then if people have questions, which I'm sure some of you will, we can maybe do some questions if that was, you know, good for you. So leave it there. Yeah. I'm just curious about approaching this subject from the other way around. How about somebody who's gone through severe stress for, say, three years? You mentioned that the foundation of the soul resilience is the central nervous system. Yeah. You know, can you repair 
a highly stressed central nervous system over time? Absolutely. Um, if, if you were a client of mine, one of the first things I'd ask you to start, well, one is sleep, but the other thing is um, we, there's this concept um, called interoception, which is the ab ability to notice what's going on inside your body. Yeah, because one of the things that one of the things that comes from trauma is we often lose connection with our body. Um, we, we we lose the ability to know what's going on, and our body is often telling us so many things at once. So interoceptive skills are the probably the first stage of a de-stressing process, and a, and a really um, obvious activity that is in, in that is interoceptive is yoga, but it could be tai chi, <coughs> it could be any kind of martial art, it could be Pilates, and so on. You have breathing meditations on your app, Calm app, Headspace, etc. But um, yoga is this kind of most obvious one that really works because what's really interesting is yoga will like, encourage you to go into an, a difficult pose, and you might think, Jesus, oh my back, my leg, whatever. But you always know it's time frame, and from doing that, you learn how much you can be in the pain or in the awkwardness and come out of it. And each time you do that, it builds, you build up your strength, you build up your resilience around that. Um, so yeah, if someone is really stressed or traumatized, we we'll often start with interoceptive skills and then start working on the cognitive after that. Does that answer your question? Or is there yeah, a bit more? I don't know. Look, I've just I've read a few yeah. subjects on this issue and um, I don't know. Look, I've come I've come across stories of guys after World War Two, yeah, who were heat for a hero that did, you know, they went on raids and <coughs> did great things and they saved lots of men's lives. But after they came back after the war, they were so personally distraught that they couldn't even hardly make a cup of tea for themselves. Yeah, uh, which suggested to me that it was their central nervous system was just. Well, usually, actually, what, just shot, what, 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 what most people report when they come back from battle is they actually miss the adrenaline. Yeah. It's usually the adrenaline and they miss the camaraderie. Because when you are doing things in such an intense way with other people, you become incredibly bonded. So, for, so most people who report those symptoms coming back from military situations, actually the missing of adrenaline and the camaraderie that causes the depression and the shutdown. <coughs> so you have to work on that. You have to work on where, where else in your life could you get that kind of bonding, etc. And what is it about the adrenaline in, in your life that made it so important to you? What was missing beforehand? So the adrenaline isn't a bad thing in itself, so is this? Really the addiction to the adrenaline. Fit, what's, you, can, you can get fatigued from the adrenaline. Your body can get too much Absolutely. stress. Absolutely. So you, you have to. So a lot of it would be learning to adapt to that. Yeah. But I mean, one of my one of my cousins has been in Afghanistan and Iraq for years in and out. And he's always saying to me the thing that he struggles with the most is missing the adrenaline and being with his boys, as he would call it. And that's the, the main driver for his depression. Interesting. Yeah. <coughs> but there's plenty of um, therapeutic interventions you can do as well for stress and trauma. Trauma focused CBT and EMDR being the most effective. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering about what the best way to build resiliency is. And is it just being in your comfort zone and then pushing yourself just a little bit more, or is it taking yourself out of your comfort zone? Doing what? Well, whatever, the, whichever aspect you're trying to be more resilient in. It's kind of both. Both of those. You want to be working on um, incremental steps, but also testing yourself with, with more shock. I mean, what, let's apply that to sleep. So make it something concrete. So yeah, yeah. Like, let's say for example you're a light sleeper. Yeah. If you wanted to increase your resiliency to that, would you just, you know, go to sleep in the worst conditions possible, so that you're so fatigued that you eventually have to fall asleep? 
or is it sort of introducing little things as you go along? Do you kind of struggle with sleep? I, not not me. Okay. Now, not okay. I, I would personally do it the other way around. I wouldn't qu cause those kind of shocks. I would like try and encourage someone to go to sleep earlier. Um, <coughs> Earplugs, things across the eyes. What is it that's causing you sleep that, uh, sleep issues as well? Is it that you can't get to sleep, or is it that, which is actually far less common than the other one, which is I can, a lot of people report, I can fall asleep, but I always wake up at three in the morning, with my head going. So what is it, what's underlying that? What are the issues going on there? What's driving that anxiety? I'm working on that. <coughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to get quite um, forensic on what's actually going on, because it, otherwise it can be quite broad. So, you know, there's different ways of looking at that, but usually, usually there's a psychological issue going on, or you've eaten cheese before you've gone to bed. You know, <laughs> it's like you really have to look at what what's actually going on there. Yes, mate. Uh, would you argue that emotional resilience is just a form of psychological resilience? There is a connection between um, psychological emotions, thought processes, something. Well, I'd say that emotional, yeah. your emotions are is deep fundamentally psychological. They're not a separate thing. Your emotional emotions are driven by um, respo either responses to events or held conscious beliefs, yeah. subconscious beliefs. So absolutely. Um, they're, they're not a separate thing. Um, you know, your emotional world is part of your psychological world. It's so not one like which drives the other? Is it the uh, conscious parts <laughs> is what drives your emotions ultimately, is it? Or uh, alter, uh, initially, and then they get integrated into your subconscious, and then they drive your emotional world as well. So you can reprogram the subconscious to yes, change. Yes, you, you, you get angry, etc. Uh, absolutely, but it requires work. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, in my experience as a psychologist, and therapist, is most people come to therapy wanting a quick fix. They don't actually want to change anything. That they usually want someone else to change, fundamentally. <laughs> usually, <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm afraid that's true. I mean, usually, it's someone else they want changing, or they want something to really just give you a quick fix. You know, like recently, I've had someone who told me that they wanted to work through all their issues really, really quickly. I was like, that's fine. There are techniques to doing that. You just got to work at it. And then they came back a few weeks later and said, this is going too quickly. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm making light of something. You know. I'm being a bit humorous, but what you're saying, you absolutely fundamentally can change your unconscious. Right. Has to be done consciously. <laughs> In the same way that if you have a, um, I I was on holiday and I was I happened to be a um, a guy who I met there, a really nice guy who was in the Irish rugby team, and he had a quirk when he was passing the ball. It said it took him a year to change a conscious practice to make that pass perfect unconsciously and the same thing uh, psychologically needs to be done and it requires work you are not just angry you are not just this it's because of thinking patterns from the past and experiences traumatic experiences non-traumatic experiences that all add up um, so it's it's, it's 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 definitely doable. Like, you know, I mean, is this something that that requires five hours a week? I know look, we're not talking about something specifically, but for somebody who's got an ingrained psychological issue, does it take, you know, is it a ten-hour week? Uh, Do you know what some people for two some, years? Some or? some people can change like that when they suddenly have an internal realization. Some people can go, oh my God, do you know what? I've just realized that my mum was really sick when that happened, and she didn't mean for that to happen. And that can change everything. And then you can have some other people where it takes weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. It, it's so individually based. <coughs> but the, fun, the, the fundamental thing you were saying, that the question that you question you answered. Involved, I suppose, I suppose. Well, yeah, the first one about which drives the emotions. Yeah. yeah, you were totally right about that. It is, it is changeable, but it's ultimately the way you think about things. And they, they, become auto, they become automatic, but it is actually your thinking that drives your emotional world. Unless it's a trauma response, and then that's something slightly different.
So I'll come to you in a sec. Someone's just here. Yeah. Um, the logic of hormesis. Yeah. Uh, if intermittent fasting would be recommended, would intermittent sleep deprivation also have the same effect? Maybe. I mean, I know they do that in the military in terms of boost resilience. You have to ask yourself why you'd want to do that. But I know that, you know, for example, um, in the military with snipers, what they do is snipers have to be able to stay in one position for hours and hours and hours and hours. So what they do is when they train them is they train them having deprived them of 30 hours sleep. Then they do their target practice, etc. So probably yes, you know the military do this all the time. They're the, they're the uh, that's where all the big special forces um, investment is where most of the cutting edge of all of this is at. And there's someone called there's a couple of, the Flow Genome Project, written a lot about this. Stephen Kohler, some really interesting thing about work with the Navy SEALs, etc. There may be some answers there. Okay. Maybe it's a similar question, because before you said that sleep is the most important uh, thing that you can work on to uh, increase your resilience. Yeah. So just thinking... Uh, all the other things are really be, important as well. What do you mean really important? See, I, I, because I can do that, I can uh, shower in the cold, I can um, fast for uh, one day a week, but if you tell me, look, sleep tell is like 90% of the effort, I'll concentrate only on that. So, and now you said that the others are equally important. So is there is there is it, it are there a few that I can pick and match, uh, pick, pick and match, so I don't have to do everything? Well, that's that was kind of hopefully what I was trying to get to across everything. earlier. No, no, is that I've got ten tarantulas, man. That they the ideal temperature is twenty one degrees. So I can't freeze my house; they'll die. <laughs> that's why. Do so they live in your bedroom? Well, it's it's a central heating for the whole house, so I have to have air conditioning in my room to bring it down to eighteen. So can I do something else? Can I shower? For an half an hour, well, you don't have the sleep problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have sleep problems? No, but I don't sleep at uh, 18 degrees. I sleep at 21 degrees, which is the ideal temperature for the tarantulas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna drop it. Well, there you go. Get rid of the tarantulas. <laughs> yeah, I'm a pet man. I'm a kid pet. There, there lies. Which do you value more? There you go, that's going to be your... Um, I'll suffer for them, my pets. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question. Yeah, open the window, man. So about breathing all that very, very yeah. interesting, and I'm try and do some of that. But how, how, in terms of resilience, I was thinking more about where something's gone wrong in your life that you have no control of. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I guess that's sort of an irrelevant example, so I, 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 I do a little bit of work. And sometimes you have a lovely piece of wood, you cut it wrong, and then it's just joking. It's, yeah. it's very annoying, and, and you know, and this happens time and time again, and, and you either give up, or if, if you're a comedian, you keep falling on stage. You know, how do you get through that, those disappointments that and be resilient <coughs> to go forward? Well, that, that would be, you, if we take a cognitive approach to that, it's like, is that part of what, what you said this happens all the time yeah so do I accept that that's a natural part of it or am I blaming myself etc are you accepting it's a natural part of it and no, you can no accept it's a mistake it's a mistake it's, yeah. it's you, you know and do, you, do people make mistakes <coughs> yeah but it's very disappointing isn't it it's that, and, and it's, a, it's enough to make you want to quit yeah but the love yeah well it, it, it totally depends that's you know like are you okay? Are you accepting the reality of the situation or not? <coughs> well, I was giving a tri trivial example. You know, you know, I've got it's still too short, but it's you know that these things happen constantly in life. Mm. And how, do, how do you how do you be resilient mm. to move on and, and not become a recluse? And a resilient person will accept that these things are very much part of life. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you know, okay, that's happened. Mm. I've got through this before. It didn't impact me. I was working with someone today whose business is about to go under. Their business went under 15 years ago. It came back stronger. While, and I totally get, while they're in it, they've got the panic of potentially losing their home, etc. That's not featuring on their radar because they have immediate issues like how are we going to find a new home, etc. But underneath that would be that resource of you've done it before, you can do it again. Not everyone's like that, though. You know, there are a lot of people who do just give up. And yeah, totally. Yeah. But that that 
there are plenty of people who just give up or want someone else to do it for them. But if you want to be resilient, and, you know, get out of that and take responsibility for yourself. Because the more your resilience boosts, the more your esteem goes up. You, you create all these virtuous cycles. It's talking to. Sorry? It's, I was going to say, it's um, <coughs> positivity literally breeds positivity. Like, yeah. if you're negative, you just breed that negativity. Whereas if you're somehow positive, you see a positive side of it. But there's a thing called the positive multiplication effect. It's like a spiral thing, yeah. 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 So two of you start sharing your uh, positive experiences together, and you'll have a, you'll, the, the emotion and everything that's generated will be stronger than each on its own. Yeah. yeah. I think also, like talking to people who've been through it, like a few years ago, I lost my job. Yeah. And I didn't see it coming, and it was the most horrible thing that had ever happened, and I was devastated. and. Then I went to dinner with some of my, my ex's friends and these were all very successful people. They said, you know what, Deb, the first time I lost my job, this is how I felt. And then, you know, by the time you get to the fifth time, it's fine. <laughs> and these were people like CEOs and country yeah. managers and everyone around the table had these stories of all the times that they'd lost their job. And I thought, oh, and it turned it around from being the most horrible thing that had ever happened to like a career milestone where I joined the club. Well, they they they, have, they, have, they helped. You. They're an external resource yeah. that helps you get out of that thinking trap of it's all me and I'm totally. It's never you know the the um, yeah. the helplessness. That was it. Yeah. So that that would be a great example of, of using an external resource, maybe one that you hadn't even deliberately done, but you're able to absorb that external resource and inspiration. Yeah. There's something I wanted to mention to those of you who've <coughs> read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, etc is that uh, your resilience can be massively boosted by some of those characters. The inspiration of, of heroes. And this is something that I think is so important with children. And, you know, encouraging, you know, what would Indiana Jones do? What would Han Solo do? What would such and such do in this situation to give you that buzz, to give you that extra um, boost? You know, that, and that's something I, I wanted to mention earlier, is that there is tremendous amount of resilience that we can gain from what these larger than life characters that we grow up with. What would James Bond do, you know, when you're ten years old? I just have it that that you know, these larger than life characters are really important for that so that you can all latch on to. And I, f I forgot to mention the art is a really important source, an external resource for um, boosting your resilience. I think it's very important also <clears throat> when you're going through tough times and you're feeling vulnerable be aware of the type of people you surround with. A lot of negative people that really suck energy out of you. A lot of people are not aware of that. It right? just seems to be yeah. sleepwalking. You even notice that some of these people are draining your energy and bringing you down. So, so when you're in good times, yeah, bring that awareness to who your support group are, so yeah. that when you're in the bad times, when your your ability to differentiate like that is blinkered by the situation, you have that strong network. Right. You know, remember that <coughs> other people are of tremendously high value to you. So get the right people around you and then they will become that resource to, to help you over the line. Yeah. Luke? I, uh, I consider myself quite resilient um, with day-to-day -day stuff. I do a lot of introspection and if something crap happens in the day I can kind of deal with it quite yeah. quickly. One thing I'm consistently really bad at dealing with are embarrassing thoughts. You may know what these feel like. They jab me in my front every day. I'll get in the shower and think about that embarrassing thing I did in 2015. And it, 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 uh, it gets to the point where I, I, I'm like, I'm actually um, kind of, I'm, I'm like, oh, Luke, you idiot. Like, why did you do that? Is there something particular about those thoughts that it's hard to be resilient with in comparison to if you um, make a mistake at your job or something like that? Is there something about embarrassment that's particularly it's, it's difficult about, to face up to? That's about um, self-compassion. Right. You know, are you, are you, you know, most of my most embarrassing things that make me cringe uh, come from my teenage years. Yeah, I'm really talking about those cringe and yeah, using And moments, actually, yeah. like, I'm, I'm fine with it now because it's like, that's what teenagers do. Right. So it's an acceptance stage, but you, you have to, <laughs> have you grieved them? Mm. Have you gone through those stages of grief to get to acceptance of them? Have you allowed it, when you think about it, do you actually allow yourself 
I mean, really, what I would suggest you do is meditate on it. Yeah, because I think I repress them as soon yeah. as they come. I kind of swear them yeah. away. Allow so, yourself to meditate yeah. on it, because you might actually find that it's not nearly as embarrassing as you think it is. Right. In the context as well. Yeah, because right? also the when you when you when you get into a good meditation practice, you actually learn that feelings, or well, one feelings aren't facts, but also feelings, they dissipate. Mm. They don't. One thing that people, so many clients think is, oh my god, if I go there, I'm going to feel that feeling all the time, and I can't do that. Whereas actually, when you meditate on it, you go into it, you intercept, you find that that anxiety starts to go after a while. Mm. The shame diminishes because you're able to actually sit with it. It's the avoidance of it all the time that's often the most painful. So next time, try some, you know, practice just another few seconds with it, another few seconds. Engage with it, with it. Engage a little bit it. longer. Yeah. yeah. It's the engagement that often you often find that's not nearly as bad as I thought. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So just filtering your ideas through the lens of entrepreneurialism. Um, you know, I hear everything from anything more than, say, four to six hours of productivity a day is a joke, it's a myth, all the way up to entrepreneurs like Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk on YouTube, has a million and a half subscribers, pays a cameraman to follow him around all, all day, runs a 900-person marketing company, and says, look, <clears throat> if you want to follow your dreams, you just got to work 17 hours a day, like, quit complaining, stop watching Lost, and just do it, right? Yeah. So... <laughs> From your perspective, is that psychologically sound though? Like how far can you get with what you're talking about? How far can that envelope be pushed? Well, Angela Duckworth's um, research <coughs> on grit, which is really worth looking at, is that she says you can only really, with the top athletes, etc., do a thing called, and uh, musicians, etc., do a thing called deliberate practice. Yeah, and deliberate practice, you know, is doing all your scales on the piano. For, and they find, you find that you can only really focus in that way in deliberate practice for two hours at a time. Now the real top athletes etc can do that twice in a day. But the hard working person does that and then uses the other hours to integrate what's going on, to do the menial boring stuff etc. So and those people for those two hours are getting into flow states. So you can only really get into flow states so the first person is kind of right and the second person is right. You can only really get into flow states one or two times a day that real super um, optimal functioning focus. But it doesn't mean for the other hours that you can't work. You just won't be in that kind of focus. Because the, that, that kind of focus that you're getting into for those two hours requires so much energy. It's, it's not sustainable. Um, you just burn out. But it doesn't mean that you don't do all that work. The other stuff, like you know, the menial stuff, tidying things up making those phone calls, sending those emails. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Just building on what you said though, is there any way that, in, in what you said, is there any way to extend that flow state uh, through other means? Sure For instance, there's like transcranial direct uh, stimulation or like obviously other people take amphetamines or... Yeah. I mean, I don't, pe people are like looking that. into all of this, yeah. but they, they tend to find that about two hours is the most you can be in a flow state. But, the real, real top people can do that twice a day, sometimes. So there wouldn't be any other way to like increase the variance there? Well, that. the thing is, what you've got to remember is you need to integrate what's happened in those right. two hours. So there's an integra integrative process that happens afterwards that's essential. In the same way that you know, in your um, when you sleep, you need, you're integrating the day's events, etc. So, so if is you that integration like a conscious uh, thing that you're going through, or is that... I mean, what it's is mostly this, what unconscious. Is it's okay. mostly that. When you come out of a flow state, usually it's that warm glow when you're just sort of satisfied, and 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 that's being the integration is going on there. Because when you're in a flow state, you're you're so um, you're so focused that you don't actually feel anything. You're not really, in a way, aware of what's going on, but you're hyper aware at the same time. And your your productivity is through the roof. You're about five to seven hundred percent more productive than normal. So when you come out of all that, think of all that information you're taking in, and that's when people in flow states talk about they have time dilation. Things seem to seem you know be very slow or very fast, etc. You're taking in so much information. If you kept stretching that out, you probably wouldn't be able to integrate it all, and it'd become counterproductive. But that's that's just me thinking on my feet right now. 
if you read I, each I, I ask because I'm, I'm a coder, so I'm like, I, I sit in front of a computer for you know X amount of hours, and yeah. I, I feel like I'm, I'm most of the time in somewhat of a flow state, but then you do walk, you do end up with with issues that you can't deal with in the moment, and then you walk away and you come back and you're like, oh yeah, that's yeah, there's a solution there. But what about like the Pomodoro technique? Have you heard of that? No. That's a situation where you go, you go like uh, 30 minutes on, you take a 10 minute break. You go 30 minutes, you take a 10 minute break. And somehow that extends the the flow state that you're that you're talking about. Okay. Well, it, I mean that that doesn't fit with what I know okay. about flow states, etc. I know that it usually takes about 20 minutes to get into flow because you have to go through a struggle phase. But there's, I, I really recommend look at, look up the Flow Genome Project. Okay. They have some really interesting detailed stuff on that. They'll probably give you some of those answers, specific answers there. Yeah. Yes. Just a general kind of a topic or a question, I suppose. Would be like, I met a guy one time and I had a long chat with him. He was a mental health nurse on a psychiatric unit in, yeah. uh, in Sydney. And he was telling me about a the patients were killing themselves. He said a lot of the nurses were killing themselves as well. Uh, do you think people are less resilient now than they were, say, 30 or 40 years ago or 50 years ago? Or do you think there's, you know, that type, I know it's a hard thing to compare apples with apples, but do you have any kind of, like, no hands-on experience? I do know that, that, that um, people suffer far more from depression now than they ever have done. Uh -huh. Remember, depression comes from two main sources. I'm excluding bipolar, etc., which is chemical condition in the brain. But I'm looking. It comes from two positions. Well, either a belief that you're self-defective, so I'm worthless, coming from a place, and all the different variations of that. I'm stupid. I'm ugly. I'm unlovable, etc. But usually this worthlessness, or it comes from this domain of um, I'm helpless. Nothing I do makes a difference. And there are more and more children and kids, etc., expressing this belief that nothing they do is going to make any difference. So, what age are we talking about? This one? These are high school kids. Yeah. So that's definitely going up and up and up. So there is definitely. Um, now, where does that come from? Well, does that come from there's higher expectations on kids now? Or does it come from the fact that they, the way they see the world? I don't know. This is this is a big question going on at the moment, and it's it's not an area that I'm particularly specialised in, etc. I don't work with um, adolescents, etc. But I do know that that is something that is that is getting worse and worse and worse. That could be largely a statistical reporting issue as well. Yeah, people just weren't reporting it before. And, and also, it's like food bank usage is going up, but they didn't exist before, so of course yeah. it's going up. It's going up because they weren't allowed to have them. Yeah. And then it became legal, and then they got blamed for. Right. Yeah. But the. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean people are more depressed now than they were. They're just talking about it more, yeah. and therefore we're hearing about yeah. it more. I think people, um, because productivity is going up and up and up and up and up and up, we need to do far less to to survive now. We have much more time to ruminate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think in the past people were much more busy with physical activity as well, and I think there is a big part of that. Is, you know, to never underestimate the the endorphins released from a hard physical activity and a sense of purpose and satisfaction in doing something that uh, is, is, you know, is maybe missing from extended education and all these kind of things. It's interesting. Is it? Th this is what a lot of the psychologists are really looking at at the moment. Well, it's funny that mental health nurse I spoke to, he said he, he grew up in a farm over the old back and he said, well, he thought a lot of people were missing was this kind of stoic character, you know, people when they were problem in their lives, they're looking for a solution from someone else, <coughs> rather than just, yeah, you know, shit happens. Well, I, I, did, I know yeah. philosophically, one of the big issues now is we're less and less encouraged to rely on our own agency, and that has a huge impact. On that our own which? Agency, free agency. will, a oh, choice yeah, yeah. to do things. <coughs> yeah. There's more and more and more a reliance on the state, on other people, to sort things out for you, etc. And I know that there's big issues with the welfare state, um, infantilizing people, etc. So that there is big issues there as well. You know, when 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 you are do your own thing and you have that self-esteem, etc. Um, so there's those issues going on as well. Definitely. <coughs> Anyone else? Yeah. If I may go back to Barry Katie's question: Is it true 
Well, the first question is, is it true? And you go, yeah, it is. And the second question is, can I absolutely know it's true? This is usually about something negative. Well, what you can do is find out. How was I prepared against a my young, young person thinks everybody hates me. Is it true? Well, and then you look at the evidence. Well, Mary doesn't hate me in class, and the teacher's being really nice to me, and so on and so on. It's to stop you going to that automatic judgment. So we have to look for evidence. You know, it can't just be a hunch. Back it up with facts, if you can. So that's the first stage, is, you know, look for the evidence. I'm shit at my job. Is that absolutely true? Yeah, it's true. Well, you got a bonus and a promotion. Oh, yeah, but, you know, and these kind of things. So the evidence you have to keep using. Just look at reality. Yeah, reality dictates. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Yeah, also, um, we need to find our mistakes when we're thinking this way. For example, everybody hates me. This means that I'm profit. I know everybody, for example. No. So we realize that, OK, uh, that's my emotions that talk right now, <coughs> not the reality. Well, that's the mind reading that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, the mind reading. So that's yeah. one of the, are, are you falling into that thinking trap of mind reading? Would be one example. But, can I ask uh, yeah. something more? But what, um, for example, some think <clears throat> it is indeed. Um, for example, someone uh, doesn't behave uh, well to, yeah. us, to us. Uh, should I also have to be resilient with that and just, you know, create excuses and like make it beautifying? It. <clears throat> I want. I want to. Yeah. I mean, where is the limit in? Uh... Sometimes you've got to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And people don't want to, mm -hmm. and it's very hard when it's family. <laughs> you know, because the, there's a, a different context there. But we have to take, you know, a big part of this is taking responsibility. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it, this stuff isn't necessarily easy, but it's rewarding if you can do it. So, yes, yeah, there is a limit also in that. Yeah, well, that's up to you. Where the, you know, sure. Do you want to choose to keep enduring that pain, or mm -hmm. do you want to. Sure. Yeah. Just have gold sours. What if it's your mother? <laughs> <laughs> well, mother is the number one issue in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yes. Really? Yeah, it's, it's Usually mum, yeah. yeah. Usually comes back to mum. Mo most, most damage is caused by what happened in the first three years of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Three years? Yeah. Bloody hell. Under seven. Yeah. Touch, well, three under years. seven is where it's really messy, because that's what we call the precognitive stage. You would have know, any of you had children, etc. You'll notice that age seven, everything changes. Yes. And what kind of uh, damage is done in the first three years? Well, attachment. <coughs> it's what we call about attachment issues. So, literally, a consistency of care. Oh. So, like. A lack of that. Or a lack of that. So, when I talk about uh, with trauma, I talk about there's basically two types of trauma that people mix up: developmental trauma and PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll often say that post I'm simplifying, but a really easy way of looking at it. Post-traumatic stress disorder is usually a result of something that's happened to you. The explosion, the fight, the witnessing of something, and so on. The fraud, whatever it is, but an event that's happened to you. And developmental trauma is usually something that didn't happen to you. You weren't hugged, you weren't breastfed, you weren't... Um, given consistent care, you weren't given consistent rules, you weren't put to bed at the right time, at the same time every night, you weren't, and so on. You were fed, you were uh, kept warm, etc. These are the crucial, really crucial, um, and, it's, and you know, this is very tragic of how many people grow up in alcoholic homes, etc., where that, that care is, is, is inconsistent, and it's the inconsistency that's really so damaging. So, how would you pinpoint where that? That's affecting you or what, or what, uh, what you were telling me. Literally, I have to go on what you're telling me. But you don't remember, you were a baby, up to three, you said, yeah? yeah? So how, yeah, how did they find out all of that? When, Because other brothers and sisters might tell you. Might tell, right. Aunts and uncles, grandparents, 
So what are the symptoms in later life then from that type of environment, toxic environment you're talking about? Uh, our, alcoholism and drug like addiction are the main ones. Okay. And any form of addiction, because addiction is, is a replacement of that insecure attachment with something that's initially secure and then stops working. The alcohol is a consistent attachment until it stops working. But it never lets you down for a certain amount of time. Um, an inability to um, stay in and maintain personal relationships. It's a big one. Maybe uh, workalism. Uh, isolation. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. But they're the, the main ones. It's usually an inability to, to maintain uh, personal relationships. Um, do we need to finish, right? Um, yeah, but you're sticking around, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I can really, really give you actually a really quick example of what really why so many people get screwed up in romantic relationships to do with attachment. You're saying so. You've all seen um, a parent, usually a dad, in the park with the young child, and they're throwing them up in the air, and they're going way like that. Yeah, and the child's going yeah, you know, more and more and more, and. Often when I watch it, I think, Jesus, that's pretty high. You know, that's a bit scary, but they're both perfectly attuned. Father and child, yeah. Eye contact, everything, total trust, really healthy bonds going on there. And another kid comes along and thinks that looks really fun. And asks to have a go, and the parent picks up the child and goes, yeah, does that. And the kid bursts into tears and runs away. What the second kid has not got enough of is what we call positive affect tolerance. They haven't had enough of being able to tolerate positive feelings, positive interaction. So what happens later on in life is, particularly people who have um, you know, attachment issues, crave attachment because they haven't had it. They see it in the movies, they see friends doing it, they see you know, it looks, and it's a sort of human need as well, and that really wanting to share and have a healthy attachment with someone. So they're in the relationship. You know, when I was working in rehab, this was a big issue. Is put the drugs and the alcohol down. First thing everyone wants to do is get into a relationship. And where every time it's like, please don't, but always do. And there's the ha happy couple. Yeah, you've got what you wanted. And someone, one of you breaks and says, I love you. And that's what you've craved all your life, is someone to say, I love you. And that happens. And you run. You're totally overwhelmed by the very thing that you've been craving. And you sabotage it. Because you cannot tolerate it. It's something you've never experienced. You didn't have that, those years of that example on a physical level. We call that positive affect tolerance, and that has to be relearned in adulthood. And that's, it's really, really sad. It makes me sad every time I tell that. It's an inability to deal with the positive that causes so many um, problems in relationship. And that's one of the things that's so important about those early years, is to have it, a, an almost inbuilt understanding of what it's like to be loved and to tolerate being loved from a very early age, and if you don't get that, it's very hard later in life. In part, what, it's a 50-50 thing, even if you have to get therapy, etc., or what? I mean, well, the therapy to relationship is often the first stage of repairing that, mm -hmm. but that's why group therapy is so important, that's why support groups like, you know, with addiction, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, etc., are so important in healing that process, of getting that in a place that's safe for you to do so. You have to be safe to be able to do that. And that must be such a, a widespread problem. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. You know, fifty percent of marriages fail, etc. And uh, when we talk about alcoholism and, and yeah. drugs, I mean, I've used uh, alcohol and drugs, but I wouldn't consider myself to be an alcoholic yeah. or a drug addict. Yeah. But you know, when you're using it, uh, self-soothing, comforting, you know, yeah. that's a thing too. Isn't it? Absolutely, but the, 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 the thing that separates the, the addict from the heavy drinker, etc., is partly the why they're drinking, and certain physiological elements as well, the inability to stop once you start. is one of the key differences between someone who's self-soothing and someone who's an alcoholic or an addict. There's a physiological thing going on in the brain, but 
that's not the same way. I can't get into that today. But that's an uh, interesting thing. Razi, do you want to? Uh, yeah, you Rewind mentioned down art on. and how characters can inspire us. <coughs> yeah. You mentioned a few novels. Can you uh, what were those novels again? Well, I'd, I'd definitely recommend, uh, f f from, from my own experience, that the novel that had the biggest profound spiritual impact on me was The Fountainhead. The Fountainhead? Uh, Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Definitely, oh, yeah, like, um, out of Shrug too, but for me, Fountainhead, partly because I read it when I was 15. I think that's a really um, crucial age. Um, and then, you know, there's plenty of other books I've read that are. Um, that do that, you know. For, if someone was younger, I'd recommend the James Bond books, the, the books. Um, you know, if you were a young teenager, um, some of Victor Hugo's work. There's, there's plenty of, you know, powerful. Even, um, <coughs> but that's just in literature. Think of it, in music, etc. You know, really explore that art that gives you a lift, because that can be very powerful in, in, in boosting your resilience. All right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah.